Okay, maybe I'll get started. Wanted to begin with an announcement about test two. So the scores are posted in Canvas. You should see your score there. Uh, you should have your test back from yesterday's recitation. If you didn't, I have a, a handful here so you can drop by at the end of class. Um, if you have any questions about test two, uh, or about the grading of test two, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you, or your recitation instructors, or your uh, yeah, or your recitation instructors would be happy to talk to you. So, uh, if you do have any questions, make sure you let us let us know. Uh, the solutions to test two aren't posted yet. They won't be posted till later in the week when we finished all the makeup exams. So that's the only delay. Any questions on all that? Okay, then, then I'll get on with today's class, today's material. So, so far we've discussed electricity, and we discussed magnetism, and then we discussed electromagnetism in which electricity, magnetism are joined together. Over the next few weeks we're going to be discussing light and the characteristics, the properties of light. And so this slide is our path through the properties, the nature, the characteristic of light over the next, few next handful of classes. Uh, actually, we discovered that light is an electromagnetic wave in the uh, last class before spring break. Uh, today, we're going to start discussing uh, one important class of properties of light, which is the reflection of light and the refraction of light. So we'll discuss these topics. Uh, in, a, in a week or so, we'll start discussing other important properties of light, the interference of light, the diffraction of light. So we'll continue with that. And then actually we'll return to the speed of light, something we've already mentioned when we discovered that light's an electromagnetic wave and we'll discover what the speed of light says about the nature of space and time. So we've got you know, a handful of classes on light as we walk around this little map, map here. Today's class, I want to go through this list of topics on light. I want to first make a comment about light and about whether light is a wave or whether light is a particle. This was a long debate about whether light is a wave or a particle. As we walk through the lectures discussing light, sometimes we're actually going to think of it as a wave and sometimes as a particle. So I'll just make some comments about that that are relevant to not just this class, but all the classes, the handful of classes that, in, in which we'll be discussing light. Uh, then we'll get on to the main topics of today's class. So we'll look at um, the law for propagation of light and some examples of it. We'll look at the law for the reflection of light and some examples of that. And then we'll look at the law for the refraction of light. We'll say what that is. And some examples of that. So propagation, reflection, refraction of light are the main topics for today's class. Okay. First, this comment about the nature of light. So, 
For hundreds of years, it was debated what light is. For hundreds of years, it was debated, is light uh, particles, like a stream of particles? Uh, is light like a wave, a rolling wave? Uh, so Newton is famous for arguing that light is a, uh, a stream of particles. And uh, one of his arguments that light was a, a stream of particles was reflection. Reflection is the bouncing of light, reflecting of light off a surface. And he argued that that was uh, consistent in agreement with light being a stream of particles. The stream of what he called corpuscles, but they're particles. Uh, another scientist, Huygens, is famous for arguing that um, light is a wave. And his evidence for light being a wave is that if light passes through, a, like if you make a little pinprick in a piece of card and you let light pass through that tiny hole, the light spreads out on the other side of the hole. That's like a wave, say a wave of water passing through a small gap or sound wave passing through a small gap. Those waves, the sound waves, the water waves spread out. So that was his argument for uh, light being a wave. Later, these two scientists, one of them we met, uh, Heinrich Hertz, the other one we haven't met, I don't think, uh, Robert Young, um, they, they devised, developed um, sort of classic experiments that in one case, show that um, uh, light was clearly a wave. We'll actually talk about this experiment uh, in, a, in a few classes. And it a absolutely clearly showed that light is a wave. And then another one that we'll talk about later in, in, in our classes by, by Hertz, he, he, he conducted this experiment, carried out an experiment that cl clearly, absolutely showed that light is particles. So after the work of these two guys, which is sort of more than 100 years ago now, it was clear, evident, that light is clearly a particle and clearly a wave. And in the end, it was concluded that light is actually, and it was concluded by Einstein, light is actually both a particle and a wave. Light, in a sense, is more than a particle and a wave. Light is something that exhibits both particle-like characteristics properties, and light also exhibits wave-like properties. And so light is something beyond just being a particle or a wave. It's something that um, embodies both particle-like and wave-like properties. And so that, that's the final conclusion of this story. And we're going to walk through this whole story. We're going to look at problems where it seems that uh, light looks like a particle. Look at um, uh, examples where light looks like a wave. And then we will finally conclude ourselves that light exhibits both particle and wave-like properties. So that's the whole story. Right, let me get on with propagation, reflection, refraction of light. This is a word of what we call geometrical optics. Geometrical optics, that's a code word for um, propagation, reflection, refraction of light. And we're going to look at that. OK, so here's geometrical optics. When we think about geometrical optics, we think about light uh, in, in a certain way. We think about rays of light and the propagation of rays of light. So here I'm sketching in geometrical optics a, a beam of light. This beam of light is traveling from the left over to the right here. And these blue horizontal lines are rays of light, like rays of sunshine, that are traveling from the left to the, uh, to the right. Now, if we were to imagine that these, these rays of light were actually waves of light, then at any particular location, like this one on the left, or this one in the center, or this one on the right, at any of those particular locations, we would imagine that um, the, the crest of the wave, or the trough of the wave, what we call the phase of the wave, is same, the same at every location here. And we would imagine that the amplitude of the wave, the size of the wave, is the same at every location here on, that's 
perpendicular to the what we would call the wave front, the rays themselves. Now that's just to introduce the sort of idea of sketching light as rays of light, because we're going to be a, sketching light passing through different things like mirrors, uh, pass, uh, passing through lenses, and we're going to be using these rays to sketch the light as it passes through mirrors, sorry, passes through lenses, bounces off, reflects off mirrors. Um, this ray approximation, this idea, the concept that you can treat light as rays, it tends to work well for um, visible light. It's a good approximation for visible light, but it wouldn't be a good uh, approximation for, say, radio waves, or, say, um, uh, yeah, radio waves is a good, good example. Um, it's a good approximation when the wavelength of the wave, so the wavelength, say, of the visible light, is much smaller than the um, dimensions of the mirror that you're reflecting the light off, or the, the lens that you're tr transmitting the light through. So this, these ray diagrams, this ray approximation, works when the wavelength of the particular electromagnetic waves, like uh, visible light, is, is much smaller than the dimensions of the mirrors and the lenses uh, that uh, you're transmitting the light through or reflecting the light off. Okay, so now we're going to go through the, the three rules for the propagation of light, the reflection of light, and the refraction of light. So the propagation of light is just, you know, how does light travel from one location to another location? Uh, reflection is what happens when light bounces off a surface like a mirror. And the third one, refraction, the word refraction is mean what happens to light when it travels from one medium into another medium. So we're looking at those those three cases. Uh, the law of propagation is, is very straightforward, right? Let's imagine there's some point P over here on the left hand side. There's some point Q over here on the right hand side. If the if light travels from P to Q, uh, from point P to point Q, it will travel in a straight line. So the propagation of light is that it propagates in a, in a straight line. Now, there's something I should say about that. Light propagates in a straight line if the medium through which it's propagating, say the atmosphere, or say the ocean, whatever the medium is, whatever the optical medium is, is, is uniform, is the same, is homogeneous everywhere. Light doesn't propagate in a straight line if that medium between P and Q, that atmosphere, if it was somehow different, optically different between P and Q, or if, or if the, uh, the P and Q were in uh, uh, the ocean. Uh, light wouldn't travel in a straight line if the, something about the optical properties of the water were different from as it traveled from P to Q. That's actually ha how you get a mirage, is that there uh, is a difference in the properties of um, the atmosphere between two locations. So the propagation of light in a straight line uh, applies, it's an important uh, application, but it it's applies when the uh, optical properties are uniform. Uh, for the material the light is passing through. Okay, law of reflection. Okay, so the classic example of reflection is, you know, reflection off a mirror, or reflection off of the still water in this pond. Those are classic examples of reflection. And um, the law of reflection is that uh, in those cases, say uh, uh, the, your bathroom mirror or the pond outside your house, um, the, the law of reflection says that the uh, reflected angle, that's the angle at which the light emerges from the mirror uh, uh, or emerges off the surface of the pond, is the outgoing light rays is actually equal to the incident angle. That's the angle that the light approaches 
the uh, mirror or approaches the surface of the water. Uh, that's the incoming light ray. Now, now, when I say that the reflected angle and the incident angle in the law of reflection are the same in reflection off a mirror or reflection off the surface of water, um, what are these two angles? Well, this diagram shows us that. So this horizontal line here is indicating the boundary between two different media, optical media. So maybe above the line is air, and below the line is water. So this is the boundary between air and water. It could be air and glass, it could be glass and water, but it's the boundary between two different optical media. This vertical line, this vertical line, is, it, it's a kind of an imagined line, but it's an important line for us in, in ray optics, in ray tracing. It's what we call the normal, the normal to the boundary. It's at right angles, it's 90 degrees, it's perpendicular to the boundary. So that's this, that's this normal. And it's with respect to that line that we measure the incident angle and we measure the reflected angle. We measure the incoming angle of the light ray and the outgoing angle of the light ray. So this incident angle here, I call it theta i, is the angle between the normal and the direction of the incident ray. That's this arrow here. And this angle theta r, this is the reflected angle, um, it's the angle between, again, the normal and the outgoing, the reflected ray. And so that's how we measure incident and reflected angles for the, for the law of reflection. Um, this has been known for thousands of years. This has been known since the Greeks and the Egyptians and, and so forth. So this law has been known for a long time. This law um, applies to smooth surfaces. So, like your bathroom mirror, it applies to like the smooth pond or the smooth lake. You're on vacation, the lake's sitting there, you're just looking at it, it's perfectly smooth. Law of reflection applies to that. It doesn't apply to rough surfaces. There, the law of reflection is, is more complicated. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's what's called diffuse reflection rather than specular reflection in this case. But we'll be focusing on, on this, this sort of classic reflection that is, um, is, is the circumstances for reflection off a mirror or the circumstances for ref reflection off a smooth body of water. Here is a picture of comparing that specular reflection. It's over here on the left-hand left side and this diffuse reflection. So upstairs here, you're seeing, um, this is obviously taken at night, these are the headlights of some truck or car over on the left and over on the right here. And so here you're just directly seeing the light in this picture. Uh, but you're also seeing reflected light in this picture. You're seeing reflected light off the surface of the road. So this is reflected light from the surface of the road. This down here is also reflected light from the headlights off the surface of the road. And this is a sort of everyday example of specular versus uh, diffuse reflection. Here the road surface is wet, here the road surface is dry. The wet road makes a smoother surface. You see, tend to see specular reflection. The dry road, that's a rough surface. You tend to see um, diffuse reflection. Okay. Final law. Law of refraction. The law of propagation is has been known for thousands of years. The law of reflection has been known for thousands of years. The law of refraction is much more recent. It's only been known for several hundred years. So it's a more recent discovery how refraction works. Now, uh, let me remind you that refraction is when light travels from one medium to another medium, one optical medium to another optical medium. So when, for example, light travels from 
air into water. That's traveling from one medium to another medium, and that, that would be an example of um, refraction. If light traveled from the water into the air, again, that's another example of refraction. If light travels from you know, air to glass, glass to air, there's plenty of examples of light traveling from one optical medium to another optical medium. They're all refraction. Now, when light travels from one medium to another medium, say from air to glass or air to water, in general, the light's direction is changed. The light is deflected in traveling from one medium to another medium, and that's what we call refraction. So refraction is just a fancy word for the deflection of the light when it travels from one medium to another medium. That's what we mean by, by refraction. So here's a picture of refraction, and it's going to lead us to a law of refraction downstairs here. So let's take a look at this picture of refraction. Here's a horizontal line. Again, it's the boundary between two different optical media. So above the horizontal line um, uh, might be air. Below it might be water. We're going to label these two different optical media with a number. This number is called the refractive index. So there's Ni here, upstairs here. This is the refractive index of the incident medium. There's Nr downstairs here. This is the refractive index of the refracted medium. And these numbers characterize, I'll talk about these numbers some more, but they characterize the optical properties. So this is, there's a number for air that describes its optical characteristics, a refractive index for air. There's a refractive index for water that describes the optical properties of water. There's a refractive index for glasses that describe the optical properties of different types of glass. And so we characterize the medium with, um, with refractive indices. This is a new thing that we didn't need to worry about when we're talking about the propagation and the law of propagation. We didn't need to worry about when we're talking about reflection and the um, uh, law of refraction. Because in propagation and reflection, we're always staying in one medium. We, when we propagated from P to Q, we were still in the same medium. When we reflected from P to Q off a, 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 a surface of water, or a mirror, we still were in the same medium. Now, in refraction, we've got a new problem. We're going from one medium to another medium. And so it matters the optical properties, the comparison of the optical properties of the two mediums. And that's why we've got refractive indices in the law of refraction. Anyway, um, vertical line, again, it's the normal to the boundary. And it's the line with which we measure directions. We measure angles to, ref to determine the incoming angle, in this case the um, incident angle, uh, and the uh, uh, outgoing angle, in this case the refracted angle. And so you see here, here's my incoming ray coming uh, down from the top, top left here, this arrow. And then here's my outgoing ray going downstairs to the bottom right, this, this second arrow here. And, um, you see that we measure the angle of the incoming ray with respect to the normal above the boundary. And we measure the uh, outgoing ray, again with respect to the normal, but now below the boundary um, it, it, here. So here's theta i. This is the incident angle again. This time this theta r is the refracted angle again. And here you see the key point. Now, in general, when light passes from one medium to another medium, from air to water, or, or whatever, its, its path is going to be changed. It's going to be deflected. And that's what refraction is. And, and so you see this uh, refraction here at this, the, this location, at the boundary. It changes its direction. And the law of refraction, refraction, refraction quantitatively describes that change in direction. So that's what the law of refraction is about. Because your question is, well, how much does the, does the light ray change its direction? How much does it change its direction depending on what were the optical materials, air and water or air and glass? How much does the light ray change its direction based on the direction it approached the boundary? 
whether we approach the boundary at a small angle or a large angle. Well, the law of refraction tells you all of that in this little law here. It says, if you read this off, if you multiply the refractive index of the incident medium, that's ni, by the sine of the angle, theta, theta i in the incident medium, that actually equals the uh, same product, the product of the refractive index in the refractive medium, times the sine of the angle theta r in the refractive medium. And so this is a relationship between the directions of the incoming and outgoing light waves, the incident and refracted light rays, and the refractive indices of the two materials. And so this can tell you, well, uh, how much the light gets bent when it tra traverses this boundary between two different materials. And this was a big breakthrough. This was, you know, this is much more complicated law than the law of propagation and the law of reflection. And this took, you know, a couple of thousand more years to figure out. It involves trigonometric functions. It involves a sine function that relates the incident angle and the reflected angle. So this is a big breakthrough. Again, uh, I'll just make this uh, small comment. Um, like there was specular reflection and uh, diffuse reflection. Specular was when you have a nice smooth surface. Diffuse was when you have a rough surface. There's also specular uh, and diffuse refraction. If you've got a nice smooth boundary between two materials, air and water, then that would be specular ref ref fraction. That's what we're going to focus on. Uh, if there was a rough surface between two different um, optical materials, that would be um, diffuse refraction. There'd be bending of the light rays, but there would be no simple law for it. And we're not going to discuss that. Okay, this is just to give you, an, I, I, I introduced a number, a refractive index. It, and it is just a number. It doesn't have units. It is just a number a refractive index that characterizes the optical properties of different materials. So how do you know that number for air or for water or for glass or whatever? Well, the way we know that um, those numbers for air, glass, water, they, they've been measured. That's how we know them. Somebody has measured them in a lab and somebody has compile a table of refractive indices and somebody published it in our textbook and we can use it. So this is a table of refractive indices from the textbook. Um, I'm just going to point out uh, that, you know, there's like 20 or more different materials on here and it lists their refractive indices. Um, but let me just make a remark about a few of them. Over here is air. Air has a refractive index that's very close to 1. Vacuum has a refractive index that's exactly 1. But air has a refractive index that's very, very close to 1. Very, very close to 1. We'll see what that means. But it means that light travels in air almost like it's traveling in vacuum. Water has a refractive index that's uh, one and a third. So water has a refractive index that's significantly different from one. Uh, and so light, we'll see, travels in water in a significantly different way uh, than it travels in, um, in, in air or vacuum. And then one other I pointed out, actually I actually pointed a few out, but uh, up here is diamond, right? You've got a diamond ring. I don't have one. I don't know why I'm looking at my hand. Um, but if I had a diamond ring, you know, like a big old diamond on here, um, what's so fascinating about diamonds? Diamond has, you know, a very, very large refractive index. That means that diamond, when light enters diamond, it gets deflected by a large amount. When it gets deflected by a large amount in your big old diamond, that light gets trapped in your diamond and it bounces around in your diamond and then it comes out in all directions. That's why diamonds sparkle. That's why we like diamonds. And so um, diamonds are attractive to us because of their very large refractive index. That gives them that, their unusual optical properties.
Okay. So let, let me say a little bit more about the importance, the significance of this refractive index. We said that air has uh, a refractive index. It, it's just, you know, part in a thousand larger than one. Uh, water refractive index about 1.3. Ice also has a refractive index of about 1.3. A diamond has a much bigger refractive index. Can't remember the number, but it's almost three. Um, what, what does that refractive index determine? Well, I, I'm going to show you how that uh, refractive index affects the wavelength of the light. I'm going to show you, talk about how it might affect the frequency of the light and how it might affect the speed of the light. So lambda, f, and c are the wavelength, frequency, and speed of light. We normally use just lambda, f, and c, I'll use it here, when we're talking about light in vacuum. And then when we talk about light in some material, maybe that material is water, maybe that material is air, we're going to add, um, I did it here, I'm going to add little subscripts on the wavelength to uh, denote that it's in some material. I'm going to add little subscripts on the frequencies. I'm going to add little subscripts on the, um, uh, and, uh, on the speeds to indicate it's in a, in a material. Um, this picture here on the left-hand show, side shows a light ray that's in, in, in blue here. It's drawn as a wave because it is an electromagnetic wave. It shows a light wave traversing two materials, one in gray, one in blue, from the top of the screen to the bottom of the screen. Maybe if you want to imagine these materials, think of this one in gray as being the atmosphere and this one in blue as being the ocean. So the light is traveling through these two materials here. These two materials have different refractive indices. So I've labeled this, this one N, N1. That's the, say, for example, the atmosphere, the air. And I've labeled this one N2. That's, for example, the ocean, the, the water. So what do those refractive indices uh, imply for the speed of the waves, the wavelength of the waves and the frequency of the waves in those different materials. So that's what these three points are about here. So, the speed of a, a light ray changes in different materials. The speed of a light ray is the speed of light in empty space, vacuum, which is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, divided by the refractive index of the material. So light rays travel in materials slower than they travel in empty space in vacuum, because we're going to divide by the refractive index. That's one or bigger. We saw a bunch of examples of that, air being a little bit bigger than one, water being significantly bigger than one, and diamond being much bigger than one. So in each of those materials, the air, the water, the diamond, the light is traveling slower than it travels in vacuum, in empty space. In air, it travels just a fraction slower, like a part in a thousand smaller, because the ref refractive index of air is only sort of a scale of a part in a thousand bigger than one. In water, it travels about a third slower because the refractive index of water was about 1.3, 1.33. And then in uh, diamond, it also almost travels three times slower because the refractive index of diamond is, um, is nearly three. So. Um, Light travels slower in materials, that's an important point, and it travels slower in materials by a factor determined by the refractive index. And so some materials it travels just a fraction slower, some materials it travels a lot, lot slower. Uh, the wavelength also changes when, when light passes into a material. So um, the wavelength of the light ray in vacuum when it passes into some material, like air, or passes into water, or passes into diamond, that wavelength actually shrinks. That wavelength gets shorter, and it gets shorter, it shrinks by, again, the factor of the refractive index. So in, in air, the, the wavelength of light 
shrinks just a tiny bit, part of a thousand again, that sort of scale, because the refractive index is only barely, barely larger than one. In water, the wavelength compared to empty space, vacuum, the wavelength shrinks, uh, shrinks by about a third, because the refractive index is 1.33. And in, in diamond again, this fantastic diamond material, then the wavelength shrinks by about ne nearly a factor of three, because the refractive index is close to a factor of three. And so the wavelength also changes with the refractive index. So you know, we started by introducing the refractive index as just a, 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 a some sort of optical, characterizing the optical properties of the, the material, that, that air and water and glass and diamond were different. But now we're seeing that those refractive indices of these different materials really tell us a lot about the speed of the light traveling through the materials and the wavelength changes in the light as it travels through the materials. There's one thing, though, that doesn't change when light travels from empty space to air to water to glass to diamond. The light could pass through all those different materials is frequency. The frequency of the oscillations of the light, the frequency of the oscillations of the electric and magnetic fields in the light, that actually wouldn't change. So the final point I make here is that um, the frequencies in the different materials, say F1 and F2 for material 1 and ma material 2, they don't change. And you can see why they don't change if you remember this relationship between frequency, wavelength, and the speed of the light ray. If the wavelength is shrinking as the refractive index goes up, but the speed is also correspondingly shrinking as the refractive index goes up, those two shrinking factors cancel each other out when you take this ratio to determine the frequency. So the frequency goes unchanged. Okay. This is just to show you, I, I'm actually not going to show you the, the demonstration um, because it, it, it doesn't, it, it becomes, okay, it doesn't work properly. <laughs> Short answer. Uh, but I'm going to show you the picture of the demonstration where it did work properly. Um, so this is a, just a, a, a picture I wanted to show you, which is an example of all the things we've talked about. So this is real light, laser light, like the laser pointer, that real light, laser light, has been shone at a block of uh, perspex, clear plastic. Um, and in shining the light at the block of perspex, uh, we see examples of propagation of light, we see examples of reflection of light, we see examples of uh, refraction of light, we see examples of all those laws for the propagation, the reflection and refraction of light. So uh, here's an incoming ray. It's labeled number one. It's the incident ray. You see it's traveling in a perfectly straight line. It's traveling through air. That's um, a uniform material. And so it travels in a straight line. Uh, it strikes this boundary. It strikes this boundary, and it illustrates an important point. I talked about reflection of mirrors. I talked about uh, refraction for the diamond. But actually, in general, when there's a boundary, you get both reflection and refraction. So some of the light gets reflected, some of the light gets refract, refracted. So some of the light is reflected back into the air in this case. Some of the light is transmitted into the, um, uh, the, the, the plastic in this case. So you see at this boundary, a reflected light ray, that's, le that's ray number two, and a refracted light ray, that's ray number three. So you're seeing reflection and refraction happen there. You're seeing the fact that for the reflected light ray, which obeys the law of reflection, the incident angle and reflected angle are the same. I hope you can imagine that. You're seeing for the um, refracted light ray, that the uh, refracted angle and the incident angle are different. The light ray is bent. The light ray is bent towards the, the normal here. So this is light going from air with a refractive index that's close to one, very close to one, to, um, 
to, to uh, plastic with a refractive index that's kind of similar to glass or water. It's about 1.3. 1, 1 I'll mention one other thing, that down the, the bottom here, you see another ray. I've called it the internally reflected ray. So this ray strikes the bottom of the block of plastic, and actually it's entirely reflected upwards towards the top of the pl plastic. That's called, I should have written, total, total internal reflection. When light, I said in general, right, light hit, hitting a boundary, hitting a surface, some of it gets reflected, some of it gets refracted. But there is a case where light is totally, 100% reflected. That happens when you travel from high refractive index to low refractive index. And that example is happening here. No light, zero light, is refracted through this surface. All the light is reflected from this surface. OK. So now I want to move on to some illustrations, examples of propagation, uh, reflection, and refraction of light. And I think, yeah, first I got a quiz. So when, when you're thinking about this quiz, think about the, the, the last topic we just talked about, and the plexiglass and the air and so forth. Um, where are we? I, I forgot to wear my watch today, so I have no idea what the time is. But actually, a computer can tell me that, and I know that. <laughs> Gosh. Not in my day did computers tell you the time. OK, so you should see this published. I'll give you um, a couple of minutes to think about it. OK, maybe I'll get started with a solution to this one. We're seeing a light ray travel from medium number one on the left-hand side into medium number two over here on the right-hand side, the, 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 these two regions here. This, is the ba this vertical line is the boundary between the two media. And now this horizontal line is the normal. Uh, for the two media. It's the one that we measure the angles with respect to. So the incident angle is, small, is bigger than the um, reflected angle. Um, and the, um, that means that the light was deflected, refracted, when it traveled from one medium to another medium. And, and the question is really um, whether 
uh, medium number two has a higher refractive index or medium one, number one has the higher refractive index, all are the same. Well, they're not the same because if they were the same, there would be no, ref no refraction, no, no deflection, no change in the um, uh, direction of the light rays. This picture here is like the picture, if you rotate it in your head, like the picture of the, the, the light in the air striking the, loose, the plastic, the plexiglass, in the, in the last slide. In that case, the um, light was bent towards the normal, i.e. the refracted angle smaller than the incident angle. That's light being bent towards the normal. Uh, because the uh, refractive index of the plastic is larger than the refractive index of the air. So, and so this is really just a, uh, an example of light traveling from lower refractive index, for example, air, to higher refractive index, for example, plastic. In that case, the light gets bent towards the normal. And so we're, we're seeing that here. So light, when it moves, when it tra light rays, when they travel, from lower to higher refractive index are bent towards the normal. Light rays, if they um, travel from uh, higher refractive index to lower refractive index, the other way around from the picture, they get bent away from the normal. Here's how I, I remember this. This is one way of remembering it. Uh, I imagine that I'm a lifeguard. That's the way I remember this, um, which sounds like a joke, but the way I remember this and being a lifeguard is that, um, well, if I'm a lifeguard, I've got to, you know, run and swim in the water to save somebody. Uh, so I've got to run across the sand to get to the water, and then I've got to swim in the water to get to the drowning person. I'm far, I mean, I'm not fast at either of these two things, but I would be faster running than I would be swimming. I think most of us are faster running than we are swimming. And so it actually doesn't make sense for me to take the straight path from you know, my chair as a lifeguard to where the, the person is drowning. I shouldn't go in a straight line. I should actually go in a line where I change my direction when I go from the sand, one medium, to the water, the other medium. I should spend more time on the sand, less time in the water, because I can be faster on the sand than I can be in the water. And that's what this light ray is doing. So imagine the light ray is the lifeguard, and is trying to get from the lifeguard's chair to the drowning person here. The light ray is faster in medium number one, the air here. The light ray is slower in medium number two, the, 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 the plastic here. So to get from the lifeguard chair to the drowning person as quickly as possible, you don't want to go in a straight line. You want to spend more time on the sand, less time in the water, so you refract at the boundary between the, um, the, the sand and the ocean. And so uh, that's why the reflection, refraction occurs this way round, that the outgoing angle here, the refractive angle, is smaller in, the, um, in a medium with higher refractive index, because that way around you get from the lifeguard chair to the uh, drowning person in the water as fast as possible. I, I, the more I started saying that example, um, imagine you're a lifeguard and this is really going to explain why it all works, I thought this is ridiculous. This is a ridic it, but it's not a ridiculous explanation. Light really does take the fastest route from point P to point Q. That path that it takes with that particular refraction, that p particular deflection, that particular change in direction, is the special path that takes the shortest time to get from P to Q. So it's actually a very fundamental thing about light. OK. So now there are a few. Um, N numerical examples, illustrations of reflection and refraction that we're going to walk through in the um, remainder of the class. I, got, I, I think I've got three examples in my slides. We might just get through, through 
two of them. Uh, let me say a, a remark. I'm not going to use the uh, document camera for these guys. The thing with the um, problems in, involving uh, ray tracing and optics and reflection and refraction is that um, when you sketch the ray tracing, the reflection or refraction, you, you kind of want accurate pictures of the reflection and refraction. That's going to be very hard for me to be hard anyway for me to do on a document camera in front of you. So I'm just put everything on my slides for these examples. I'm going to work off the slides. Okay, so here's an interesting thing. This is the I, I, most of you, almost all of you, I'm sure, weren't alive when this happened. But I was alive. I was nine years old. I was at you know my junior score, and um, the U.S. landed on the moon. It was the most I can still remember it now. It was the most amazing moment. Uh, we were all in this big as we were at school, we were all in this big hall, and we were all sitting there watching this landing going on, um, and it was just an amazing thing. Um, and here we are, here's a snapshot. In the snapshot, it looks like, well, this is maybe the duty-free from the airport on the way to the moon. But this is not duty-free, or this is not uh, the suitcases. These are what we call retro-reflectors. These are special devices for reflecting the light. And the astronauts left re retro-reflectors on the moon. And retro-reflectors uh, the, the, these ones were kind of cubes, two foot by two foot by two foot on each side. So that's what he's carrying, these two foot by two foot by two foot cubes. And they have the property that if you shine light on them, the light is shone back to you exactly along the direction it approached from. So I shine light over towards you, and... Um, it's reflected straight back towards me. But then I shine it over here, it gets reflected straight back towards me. And no matter what incident angle I strike these uh, retro reflectors, light is always shone back along the path that it approaches. So um, the reason they, they left those on the moon, these retro reflectors on the moon that have this property, uh, is that from Earth we can shine a laser on, and from Earth, we do shine a laser on these two foot by two foot by two foot refreshers, and the light comes back to the lab where they shone the laser, and they can measure the, how long it took the light to get from the moon to back again. Uh, if they didn't have this property, if they just left a mirror on the moon, right, you shine the light, the laser light on the mirror, it just flies off, you know, halfway across the Earth or somewhere else. So they have this fantastic property that they send light back where it came from. So you can shine light on the moon, you get it back, you can time how long the light took to go to the moon, come back, you can measure, because you know the speed of light, how far away the moon is. You can even measure the fact that, I, I don't know if you know this, the moon is actually getting further away from us. Every year it gets a little bit further away from us. Every year it gets a few centimeters further away from us. And they were able to measure that effect that the moon is not just going around in a circle, it's going around a spiral, and it's spiraling away from Earth. Spiraling away from Earth very, very slowly, a few centimeters a year, but it is spiraling away from Earth. And that was discovered by the, the retro-reflectors. Okay, so th this example is uh, an example of the law of reflection. Um, and it's an example of using the law of reflection, and we're going to understand how the retro reflector works. Now, to make things a little bit simple, um, the, the retro reflectors on the moon are three-dimensional, so they have three mirrors that are arranged perpendicular to one another. Uh, we're going to think of a two-dimensional example where we just have two mirrors. Uh, that are perpendicular to one another. So this would be a, a two-dimensional retro-reflector. It has the property, just to stress it, if you make this arrangement of these two mirrors perpendicular to one another, I got one that's horizontal, and then I got one that's vertical, and they got 90 degree angle between them, an incoming light ray striking, say, the lower mirror, 
gets reflect, reflected off the lower mirror, gets reflected off the vertical mirror, gets reflected back, and it gets reflected back in exactly the same direction that it approached from. That's the key property of a retroreflector. And that um, reflected back in the direction it came from, that happens no matter what the incident angle of the light ray is. So, you know, this angle here is probably like 50 degrees. But if it was 80 degrees, or 20 degrees, or 10 degrees, or 80 degrees, it'll, it'll be reflected back in the direction it came from. So it's a, it's a fantastic property. Even if it is struck the upper mirror, the, the vertical mirror, and then reflected off the bottom mirror, it'll still be reflected back exactly in the direction it came from. So this is how, you know, the lab's way over here. Uh, we uh, shine a laser on the moon, on the retroreflector, and it gets reflected back to the lab. So how does that all work? Well, I'm going to show you a few slides uh, that are just based on the law of reflection. This is an example of the law of reflection that are going to uh, show us uh, why the retroreflector reflects the light back in the same direction it came from. Again, I want to stre uh, stress, if I just had one mirror, that's not true. So supposing my, the palm of my hand is a mirror, and we're going to strike it with uh, you know, a, a laser beam. If you hold the laser beam, right, um, well, the light may head back towards you. Your, your incident angle was sort of zero degrees. But if somebody over here held the laser beam, then the reflected light goes to over here towards the left. If somebody on the left ha held the laser beam and reflected it off this mirror, it goes over towards the right. So it certainly doesn't come back to you except in one special case for you. With the, if this was a retro reflector, now I've got a retro reflector, no matter who shines the light on the retro reflector, you're going to get the laser beam back. So that's the key, key property. Okay, so here's a, a picture of the geometry of the retro reflector. Again, a horizontal mirror, vertical mirror, mirror at right angles. Uh, I've got the incoming light ray, the internal light ray, because it's going to bounce off both mirrors, so there's an internal ray we never see. And then I've got the outgoing light ray, and I've added the law of reflection. So the law of reflection is that the incident angle so I called it theta for this incident ray here, is equal to the reflected angle. And here's the reflected angle for the first reflection. So this theta, this theta are the same thetas because that's the law of reflection. So I just use one symbol to denote them. So that is the law of reflection. I got a second reflection on the second mirror, the vertical mirror upstairs here. And again, the, the law of reflection applies to to this second reflection here. So whatever this incident angle is, it, it's it, in general different. I call it theta prime. It's going to be the same as this um, reflected angle here. This, this is also theta prime. And this is the outgoing ray. And so that's just adding to the picture the, the law of reflection. But the key point is that these two angles are the same. This pair of angles are the same. So that's going to be helpful to us. <clears throat> Based on those angles, we can write a little formula for the deflection of the light ray on the re first reflection. And we're going to write a little formula for the deflection of the light ray on the second reflection. And the reason I'm writing formulas for the deflection of the light ray on the first reflection, this is the first time the direction is changed, and the uh, deflection of the light ray on the second reflection, that's the second time that the light ray is changed, is that I want the total deflection. I want to figure out the total deflection of the light ray because I've already told you the answer to the total deflection. If it comes in in this direction, it gets reflected back where it came from. That's a deflection of 180 degrees. So we're trying to show, we're trying to prove, we're trying to establish that the, the total deflection of the retro reflector is always 180 degrees. And we're going to show it by figuring out the individual deflections of the mirrors that make up the retro reflector. So there's a deflection here. I call it, this is delta, delta 
delta 1, subscript 1, that's the deflection on the, the first reflection. This is delta 2, the reflection on the second deflection. What are these deflections? Well, you can read it off this picture. This is the light ray. If the mirror wasn't here, it would go down on this dash line. Uh, but the mirror was there, so it went up here. How much deflection did it get? That's this angle from this original direction to this new angle of the reflected light ray. Is this angle marked in red here. Well, it's 180 degrees. That would be a complete reversal. Less this theta and less this theta. Just a little bit of geometry, right? So um, this, this deflection is 180 degrees less 2 theta. And I hope, hope you can see that from this little picture. The same thing is happening up here, right? The light ray, this internal light ray, was heading up towards the vertical mirror. It is reflected for a second time off the vertical mirror. It was going in the direction of the dash line. Its direction is changed to be the direction of this reflected ray. What is the amount that the light ray was deflected? I'm calling it now delta 2. It's the second reflection. It's 180 degrees. That would be complete reversal around here. Less theta prime and less another theta prime. This angle in red here, this delta 2, is 180 degrees minus 2 theta prime. Now, these two deflections are, are in general different, right? Because the angle that you strike the bottom, the horizontal mirror, the angle that you strike the vertical mirror, they're generally different. And so they're different deflections. But we're going to discover that if you add up these two different deflections, they actually turn out to always add up to the 180 degrees. So let's see how that works. OK, the key point is just the bit of trigonometry. And we all love trigonometry. And there's lots of trigonometry in optics, you'll be pleased to know. Um, here's a little bit of geometry that we need here. That angle of reflection for the first reflection, we called it theta. That angle of reflection for the second reflection, we called it theta prime. Those two angles make up a right angle triangle for perpendicular mirrors. This angle here, this is the second reflection, theta prime. This angle here, theta uh, that's the first reflection, make a right angle triangle. I can just draw it here, made out of the normals to the, to the mirror. That means something very important. That means something very important for a relationship between theta and theta prime. It means that um, theta plus theta prime actually must be 90 degrees. Theta plus theta prime must be 90 degrees because a triangle has 180 degrees. We've used up 90 of them in this right angle here. There's only 90 degree left. It must be that theta and theta prime share 90 degrees. Their sum is 90 degrees. So just a little bit of geometry about the retro reflector tells us that theta and theta prime that determine the deflections at the two surfaces under the two reflections um, they're, they're not just arbitrary. They're related to one another. Their sum is 90 degrees. Okay, so that's the sort of punchline. Now we can figure out the total deflection. So that's what I'm doing on this side. Uh, sort of, hurrah, the total deflection is, well, the total deflection delta is the sum of the two individual deflections at the horizontal mirror, at the vertical mirror. The equations for the two individual deflections were this one here on the left-hand side. Remember, it's 180 degrees minus twice the incident angle on the horizontal mirror. The same thing for the, the second re reflection is 180 degrees minus the incident angle on the uh, second mirror. Uh, if we rearrange this, right, I'm going to combine the terms with, with just the, the numbers in it and with the angles in it. It's 360 degrees, 60 degrees, eight, 180 plus 180, minus two times theta plus theta prime. Theta plus theta prime, we argue by a bit of geometry, is 90 degrees, because they formed a right angle triangle. So this whole thing is 360 degrees minus 2 times 90 degrees, which is 180 degrees, which gives us 180 degrees overall. We prove the retro reflector. We prove that it sends back the light in the same direction it comes from, uh, independent 
independent of your angle of incidence. Whatever your angle of incidence, and actually whatever mirror you strike first, it will send the back the light the same way. So as I say, um, if I had a plane mirror, and you look at the plane mirror, you, 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 you shine light at the plane mirror, it sends from light from the right, it will send light over towards the left. If from the left you send it onto the plane mirror, uh, it will send that light beam, laser beam, over towards the right. If this is a retro reflector, you send your laser beam on from the left, you get it back. If you send your laser beam on from the right, you're going to get it back. That's how we measure the distance to the moon, to fractions of a centimeter. That's how we figured out the moon is spiraling away from Earth at a few centimeters a second. A second, gosh. <laughs> a year. Um, okay. So that, that was one example. Uh, second example, I want to talk about um, refraction. So here's a famous uh, example of refraction. I, I don't know if you, you've ever noticed this. this don't try this with the sun. Try, try with the moon. You look up at the moon. Uh, you can see moonlight directly, obviously. You see the moon. Um, but around the moon, the moon has a halo. Actually, the sun has a halo too. But the amount of halo uh, around the moon, around the sun, depends on some details of the atmosphere, what's going on in the at atmosphere. But in general, you'll see a halo around the moon, um, and you shouldn't do this, but if it, it, you, there is also a halo around the sun. That halo is, is not the direct light from the moon or the sun into your eyes, but it's indirect light. It's indirect light where the Moonlight, sunlight, has refracted off ice crystals in the atmosphere. Tiny ice crystals in the atmosphere. And ice crystals, ice has a particular structure where it forms crystals that have 60 degree angles in them. And they act like 60 degree prisms. And so it's as if the sky is littered with tiny 60 degree prisms. These tiny 60 degree prisms, the light strikes gets refracted, comes out, gets refracted again. So like retroreflectors, two reflections, this is um, uh, two dual refractions, that, that's indirect light that you see, and that forms this halo around the sun, forms a halo around the moon. So we're going to see how, how that works. You can see it in the picture. This is a picture, say, the, the, the sun. sun. The sun's in the center. This is direct light from the sun. But you can see this circle around here. This is the indirect light from the sun. This is the, the halo. And so you see very clearly down here this halo around the sun. Uh, inside the halo, you don't see any of this reflected light, refracted light off the crystals. Outside the halo, you do see refracted light. And what you're noticing is the halo is this sort of boundary between where you see refracted light, where you don't see refracted light. The angle of the halo is 22 degrees in the sky. It's always 22 degrees when you look at the sun, look at the uh, moon, when you don't look at the sun and you look at the moon. Uh, so it's always 22 degrees, and this is explained by the law of refraction. So it's a simple application, a natural application of law of refraction. Let's see how that works. Um, so this is the problem. This is a physics problem behind it. Uh, here's an ice crystal. Uh, as I say, they form these sort of 60 degree corners. So this is like a, this is what we call a 60 degree prism. It's a triangle through which we're going to pass light. One refraction over here, one refraction over here on the right. Uh, and this particular triangle is an you know, equal angled triangle with 60 degrees in each corner, adding up to 180 degrees. Here comes the light ray in from the bottom left. It gets um, refracted, so bent, into the ice. It traverses the ice, gets refracted again when it comes out into the air. Here it is going down to the, the bottom right. And um, I've indicated here this, um, this deflection of the light ray. It's a, um, a characteristic deflection. We're going to call it delta again. And uh, we're going to show that this is 22 degrees. This is why you get the halo at 22 degrees. You get the halo when the light takes this particular path, where the light traversing the crystal of ice is 
parallel to the bottom face. That's the minimum deflection you get. That's why inside the halo there's no refracted light. Outside the halo there's still some refracted light. Uh, so this is the path of minimum refraction through a prism. So we're going to figure out what that minimum angle is. I'm totally panicking because I've got to do it in five minutes. <laughs> so if I pass out, you know why. Um, okay, so I, what I'm going to tell you actually is the story of the refraction on the left-hand side. And then um, I'll just say, well, the same thing happens on the right-hand side. And that's kind of like, the, a bit like the retro reflector. If you explain the horizontal mirror, the, the, the explanation of the vertical mirror is the same. Uh, you explain the left-hand refraction, the right-hand refraction is the same. Uh, so on this slide now, I've, I've marked three angles. And I want to explain each of those. I want to I wanna figure out, actually, each of these angles. One's the incident angle of the light ray in the air, strikes the crystal, one's the reflected angle, and one's the deflection on this first reflection. This is meant to be a delta L for delta left, or it could be delta 1. It's the first refraction. There's going to be a second one over here. It's going to be the same. So I want to explain what these three angles are. And so we're going to walk through some geometry and law of reflection and explain these angles. Okay, first bit of geometry. I think I jumped two slides in. First bit of geometry is geometry of parallel straight lines. So um, this ray, this internal ray, is parallel to this bottom edge. That means that if this angle is 60 degrees between this surface of the, of the uh, prism and this horizontal edge of the prism, then this is also 60 degrees. So I just added the fact that I know this is 60 degrees by geometry. It's just because this ray is parallel to this bottom edge. Uh, I hope that's, that's straightforward. That's a bit of geometry about parallel lines. Another bit of geometry. This normal, from which we measure incident and refracted angles, that's, that's 90 degrees to, um, to this surface here at which the refraction is occurring. If we used 60 of them up here, which we, we already figured out, then this reflected angle, which refracted angle, which is the remainder of them, that must be 30 degrees. The total of the 60 and the 30 must add up to 90 because the red line is perpendicular to the surface here. So it's just another bit of geometry. There's a bit of geometry about perpendicular lines. So two bits of geometry, and I've actually told you the reflected angle. Once you know the reflected angle, well, the law of refraction, I've written it all out up here, you can check it later. The law of refraction, if you know the ref refracted angle, and you know the refractive indices, uh, we know the refractive index of, of ice is 1.31. We know the refractive index of air, we just call it 1. It's not exactly 1, but it's very close to it. Uh, we know the refracted angle is 30 degrees. You can calculate the incident angle. So I just used the law of reflection, refraction to calculate the incident angle. came out to be 40.9 degrees. So now I've got this angle, theta i. Finally, last step. The difference between the incident angle and the reflect, refracted angle is the deflection of the rays. The light was going up along this path. It got bang, bent and went along this horizontal path here. The difference between the 40.9 degrees and the 30 degrees is actually this angle in here. It's the deflection. It's 10.9 degrees. So those last four slides were a story, a story of using a bit of geometry, of parallel lines, perpendicular lines, and the law of reflection to figure out what the, diffract, what the deflection of the light ray is when it struck that left-hand side surface. It was deflected by 10.9 degrees. If we did the same thing for the right-hand surface, it's all the same geometry, it's all the same law of refraction, you get the same answer. You get another 10.9 degrees on the other surface. 
So in total, you get a deflection that's 21.8 degrees, and 21.8 degrees is, that's the total deflection of the light ray, and what was the halo? It was, it was I told you it was 22 degrees, it's actually 21.8 degrees. That explains the halo. It's light crystals, it's double refraction of light on light crystals, gives you a halo around the sun, gives you a halo around the, um, uh, halo around the moon. If you ever look at it with the moon, you'll notice that it has colors to it. It has colors to it because actually the refractive index 